Love Truth presents the Parent and Family Resource. This presentation is an introduction to emotion. In this presentation, Eloisa discusses the importance of feeling emotion in order to make soul-based change and have meaningful relationships with God, ourself and our soulmate, and with others. She discusses giving up false beliefs about emotion as an important aspect for the future happiness and general well-being of each individual. Recorded on the 24th of June 2021 from 8.30am in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Hello and welcome to the Parent and Family Resource. I'm Eloisa. This presentation is about emotion. I've already discussed emotion in all the previous videos if you've watched any of those and emotion will be referred to in pretty much every video that we speak about. This presentation is specifically about the importance of changing your relationship to emotion if you are not already an 100% emotional being. Emotion is the way that real soul change is going to occur and as I've mentioned in previous presentations, it is only by making soul-based emotional change that real change happens in your life. So emotion is exceptionally important. Emotion is often referred to as energy in motion. That to me seems quite abstract. In a practical sense, emotion is the feelings that you have that you either express or you don't express. So you may feel, if you feel happy, if you feel joyful, if you feel delighted, if you feel sad, if you feel depressed. Depression is actually a suppression of emotion, so it's not actually emotion in itself. But if you feel sad, angry, fearful, or a whole um, on the spectrum of those, like from annoyance or frustration to fury, from absolutely being like gutted, as some people say, <laughs> but feeling that feeling and actually expressing emotionally what that feels like. So if we look at, let's say as an example, look at a little child. They cry when they're angry, they cry when they're sad, they cry when they're afraid, they cry when a lot of different things, and those cries feel different when you're a parent you can actually start to understand in the way that a baby is communicating with you via the way they cry. Sometimes they just have like dissatisfied cries or sometimes they have tantrums as they get older and they just throw a big tantrum when they don't get what they want. Now all of those are emotion. Now I know that I'm saying it as though we don't know what it is, but as we get to be adults, we're often suppressing our emotions so heavily. So looking to children for how we can express emotion is a wonderful example and something we can learn from. I imagine that as I say that, there's some beliefs or feelings that may come up for, for various people watching these videos. And there's a lot of judgment around emotion in our society. There's a lot of feelings of shutting down and suppressing emotion, not just allowing whatever you feel to be expressed, of censoring yourself, of toning yourself down, of not being too expressive. A lot of suppression and shutdown happens when we're very small children and we learn to cope in society or to manage our emotions. I'm here to say you need to stop managing your emotions. I have, I've experienced that if you fully experience an emotion and you feel it, if you fully express and release an emotion, it's, it's done, it's gone, it doesn't affect your life anymore. If you hold on to emotions, if you suppress emotion, if you deny emotion, so you might even deny that you even have an emotional response to something. Often, well, that suppression of emotion, if you have children, will be reflected by the children. That denial of emotion will actually cause, over time, depending on what the emotion is and depending how heavily it is suppressed, it can cause illness and eventually it will create your own death. That is how important emotion is and key to your life is to feel and express and let it come out of you. As adults, we often have a distorted relationship with emotion rather than seeing it as something that will, is of benefit to us, will help us, actually is part of our expression of our soul and an expression of ourself. We often are so worried about everyone else in the world and sometimes we're actually just even worried about our own feelings. 
and it's sometimes not even about others. And what I've found is that sometimes I'm saying, oh, it's about others, or I'm so afraid they are going to, or the world is going to. But really, when I say those things, when I drill down into it, I'm actually finding that it's just me being afraid of feeling some emotion. I have had fears of how people may perceive me or how they may treat me if I'm emotional. In the end, it's about my own relationship to emotion. As I've become more comfortable with emotion and expressing my own emotion, I've found that I'm actually much more comfortable with other people feeling their emotions. I've found that it opens up. I become more logical when I've felt emotion. I can see more truth. I understand what feelings I have and why I'm having them. So emotion is a way of actually coming to know myself. Emotion is, is very important in our lives and we are often disregarding it or shutting it down. And as parents, we're often overtly, covertly or unwittingly shutting it down in children. And this is very, very damaging to children. If you're engaging this resource and you're experimenting with the things that I am raising with you, you may have already come across how hard you feel it is to feel emotion. And there's many feelings about emotion that come up sometimes as you're feeling the emotion. So sometimes you can be crying and then you feel like you're stupid or you're an idiot or you, know, you start judging yourself for your emotion. Or you may be feeling and then sort of dismiss it and go, oh, this is nothing. Why am I being so silly? You may minimize it and make out that it's not actually such a big thing to shut and suppress it down. You may say, oh, no, I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm fine, when you're not. And I'm noticing, you know, with our kids as they're getting older, they'll hurt themselves. And when they were little, they'd just cry and, and off they'd go and feel about it. But as they're getting older, they're, they're suppressing their emotion or they're worried about how others are going to perceive them or their peers are going, what their peers are going to do or how they're going to interact with them. Emotion, as an adult... Your relationship to emotion needs to change and that's going to be a process you're going to need to feel through and you'll have feelings to feel about feeling emotion. <laughs> In the divine teachings of divine truth, which this resource is based upon taking teachings of divine truth as taught by Jesus and Mary Magdalene, or also known as A.J. Miller and Mary Luck, taking principles of those teachings and applying them to parenting. To understand those principles, it is an emotional process. You will not understand really what they are about until you actually go through emotion and then you'll begin to understand what they are about. And I say that from my own experience. I've listened to the teachings for 11 years. At the beginning I, I thought I understood and I've only realized that as I've gone through emotional process to feel about these principles and to come to actually understand them in my heart and my soul that now I'm beginning to understand them. And I don't understand all aspects of them. I understand parts of them and I also know that this is a learning that I will continue to grow and learn as I develop in love and I develop my understanding and my soul capacity to absorb and understand these principles and teachings of divine truth. So this is not an overnight quick fix resource. This resource is one that is going to be an ongoing, in a way it becomes the way you live life. And emotion is the way to live life. It's the way to have more happiness in your life and to feel connected to yourself and to others. It's a way to understand what has happened to you in the past and also what is happening to you now and why you respond the way you do. All of those things are emotional. They are all via your emotion that you come to know and understand yourself. It's via emotion and feelings that you have, if you desire to have a relationship with God, that's how the relationship with God works. Having a relationship with your partner and your children is all about emotional expression because it's not the words or the, the um, you know, it's not just the words you say because they are just a reflection of your soul and the words and the actions you take are all reflections of either unhealed emotions within you or your own emotional expression. So the aim in this resource is to become a 100% emotional being. When I first heard a presentation by Jesus and Mary on becoming a 100% emotional being, I had a number of different reactions. One, I thought, oh wow, that'd be amazing because I'd started to experiment with emotion and I also had interacted with Jesus and Mary and you know, Jesus particularly very 
is connected with his emotions. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, I'd like some of the qualities that I saw in my, in, in my friend and went, yeah, I'd like to, to have that opening. But then I also had some fears and some worries and concerns about what that would be. As I have engaged becoming more emotional being, I, or person, I have found that it's not really what I expected at all. There was a lot of uh, corrupt faith, if you like, or, or un, um, false beliefs. And these are terminologies that's used in the divine truth teachings. But really it means that your false beliefs are, are things that you believe to be true, but they're not actually true from God's perspective. Or when you go through an emotional experience, you come to understand that it was a belief you had, but it's not actually true. And it was just something that you felt was true, but it's not actually true. So that's sort of how I see a false belief. Then you have corrupt faith. And your corrupt faith is that but you believe that something's going to happen if you do it. So you may f believe, for instance, that if you feel your grief and you just let yourself cry, that it's never going to end. Now that's a corrupt faith. And often that corrupt faith, then we go, well, it's never going to end. So there's no point feeling it because I'll just be sad all the time and I'll never be able to do anything. and It will just be too much for me. All of that is false beliefs and corrupt faith. It's not true. But you're not going to know that it's not true until you go through the experience and then you will have faith that oh, I actually was able to feel my grief and I didn't die or I was able to feel my grief and my life didn't fall apart. I was able to feel my grief and wow, look at now I feel like happier and I've got some actual joy in my life and I'm not always sad or always feeling depressed by trying to shut down my grief and my emotion. But these things you will not know as truths until you feel them for yourself. This presentation is about changing your relationship with emotion. In the presentation, we'll cover a little about what emotion is, which we've already done. I'll also look at um, just some of the emotions and the effect that that has on children and how it negatively impacts um, children by denying or suppressing your emotion as a parent. And we'll also talk about the benefits of being an emotional being and what that creates in the family. Also how important it is to allow emotion in the child um, and let, let their emotional expression be expressed for their personal development. Let's talk about allowing emotion in a child first. If you are shut down to your own emotions and you have corrupt faith and false beliefs about emotion itself, where you feel that it's a bad thing or it's too much is no good, or if you may have gender issues about emotion, like boys don't cry, boys need to be tough, boys don't, shouldn't um, express their grief. You may also feel it's fine for boys to be angry and they're allowed to like attack and whatever, but not cry. You may have feelings with girls of like, oh, it's okay for a girl to cry, but sometimes she can be a bit manipulative and you might be condescending towards a woman and emotions. And then you might have other beliefs with women, but women aren't allowed to be angry. If they're angry, that's a bad woman. So you can see there's some, these are stereotypical beliefs, but I see them being expressed by women themselves or men themselves, and also adults towards children. So there's many different ones as well, but we'll just take these ones at this time. Now, if you have those beliefs in you, even if you say, you know, you might watch this video and go, oh, I've heard emotion is feeling good. I need to let my child feel emotion. But... If you feel and you have those beliefs in you and you haven't released them emotionally, then you are going to shut your child down. In previous videos, I've made the comment that it's not the words you say and it's not necessarily the uh, facade actions you take, so the false actions you take of trying to look a certain way or present yourself in a certain way. You may feel like, oh, I want to be okay with emotion. Oh, I'm totally okay with emotion. But I suggest to you to examine your real beliefs about emotion because that is what your child will feel. If you are completely open and with your own emotions and you're totally okay with feeling your own emotions, your children will be too. They'll just feel their emotion, they'll express it, and then they'll feel it until it's done, and then they'll move on. If you're not okay with your emotion, then they may act out in different ways. So they may not actually feel the, what they feel. They may attack somebody else because they're acting on the emotion rather than feeling it. So I need to cover a few points about feeling emotion. Allowing yourself to express emotion, I speak about that a lot, and I'm talking about in a self-responsible manner. So as an adult, that's not flying into a rage and like um, angrily attacking everybody else in your environment. 
as an adult, we do not need to share our emotional experience with somebody else. That's not an act of love to others. We would be open and communicate and be open, but the actual feeling of our emotion is a very personal process. If we want others to be involved in that, if we want to dump, I call it dumping our emotion on someone else, where you basically like feel your emotion, but it's someone else's problem. If you feel like someone else made you feel a certain way, all of that's actually false beliefs. The emotions you have inside of you were created, some of them, some of them, were created and caused by when you were a very small child and you may have had to shut yourself down or your parents, you absorbed certain things from your parents or the environment that you grew up in. Now they were created from an external source, that of your parents and the environment. As you get older, you start acting on those emotions. Now that is your choice. That becomes your responsibility. And once you become a, an adult, you're now completely making choices to either ha act in harmony with love or disharmony with love. Now, in harmony with love would be feeling and expressing your emotion. And, and then that would create it that you wouldn't take so many unloving actions. But if you don't feel and express and work through your emotion, then you're going to take unloving actions and harm others in the process. Often with emotion, I feel that people have a large fear about acting on their dark emotions. So we're, most people are okay, well, I was going to say most people are okay with uh, their more like joyous or uh, happy, expressive emotions. But to be honest, some people actually are very uncomfortable with fully expressing their joy, fully expressing their uh, uh, enthusiasm for something or fully expressing their heartfelt desires and just being passionate and open and allowing all of those feelings to come out. In Australia, there's something called the tall poppy syndrome. And it's where people pretty much get cut, cut down for standing out or for really being expressive and allowing themselves to feel how they feel. And it's more about oh, like when they achieve greatness, people sort of like to pull them down and make them sort of feel bad to somewhat. And I feel that's a yeah, it's a, a terrible thing to do, particularly for a child. It's like you want them to be fully expressive. You want them to be able to joyously express themselves. And as, as adults, we've often lost that or we've suppressed it ourselves. So you may not be comfortable with overly joyous and ha you know, happy emotions or um, yeah, just, I suppose, emotions of elation or wonder or feelings like this. You may have beliefs and feelings about those emotions just as much as you do of, say, the more darker emotions, you know, of anger and rage and feeling your fear and all these kind of things. We have a whole spectrum of emotions, and I'm just mentioning a few, I suppose, main emotions, but there's a whole variety of emotions that come up and that when you're desensitized to, you don't even realize that you have. I know that I've felt some emotions that I've n I never experienced before at times um, over the last years. Uh, one was like this feeling of sort of satisfaction of having achieved something. I'd never had that because I'd never actually achieved anything on my own merit. Um, I'd always been sort of reliant on others or others had been telling me so it wasn't my full creation. And that was a lovely feeling and something that was quite surprising. So there's these lovely gifts of when you actually start feeling through emotion and allowing yourself to express yourself. These things you find about yourself that you may have been suppressing so heavily that you didn't even know about. So the main point I was trying to make here was that often we are, we have these emotions and I wanted to specifically say, speak about the dark emotions we might have like anger and fury and we often are so afraid of feeling them because we feel we'll act on them. And mostly what I observe is that people are acting on their dark emotions. You don't have to. You could just feel them, but not act on them. And it's an actually very important for our soul growth and development in order that we do feel our dark emotions, but don't act on them. So we feel our rage about something, but we don't take it out on everyone. So that's why I'm saying the self-responsible aspect comes in. Take yourself off to your bedroom and express your rage on a punching bag or screaming into a pillow or, you know, cutting up boxes or smashing plates or, you know, go to the op shop and get something that you can destroy if you want to destroy something. Don't do that to another human or to the environment or to, to other, other beings or creatures. That's not 
a loving way to express your emotion and you'll create more damage and more harm and come to feel worse about yourself by doing those things. So when I'm speaking about emotion, I'm speaking about the responsible feeling and expression of your emotion. And that's something that you as the parent will need to decide to do and to actually um, express your emotion. And you can be an example and model that to the children. Children are doing it beautifully automatically. And if you can just let that emotional experience happen and work through your false beliefs and your corrupt faith and the pain that you have or the feelings you have and the suppression in you that you have, if you can work on that and release that, then the child will just keep feeling their emotion and you don't have to do anything. The child will naturally want to express its emotions. Its environment and its parents are going to be the people who shut that down. And when I'm saying parents, caregivers um, are included in that. And it's sort of like a big parent uh, overview. Using the word parents to cover guardians or people who are influential in a child's life. Changing our relationship to emotion is part of the focus of this resource. The first step is to look at where you are right now in relation to emotion. Well, how, what do you feel about emotion? What are your beliefs about emotion? What are your uh, feelings towards genders and emotion? So, you know, your feelings about women feeling emotion and men feeling emotion. Where are you at right now with these, uh, with your with your beliefs and feelings and ideas about what, like, what is it acceptable for emotion. The joy in our life is, comes from expressing emotion and being emotional. And I know for me personally, I adore seeing little children who are so expressive. They are, it's so lovely to see that. And I love seeing um, adults who are also emotionally expressive. I feel, it makes things so much easier in the sense of a partner relationship when your partner is very expressive and open and transparent about what they feel and think and what's going on for them. All of that is a wonderful qualities to develop in your, in your, like the truth and transparency to develop in your partner relationship and it will bring you closer and be more connected with each other. You won't have to guess what your partner's feeling. You won't have to try really hard to work it out. And if you are having to try really hard to understand someone and they're not truthful and transparent, if someone is not truthful and transparent, that is out of harmony with love because love is truthful and transparent. It makes a relationship, it cuts out a lot of manipulative techniques in relationship. It also highlights in relationships where someone actually is. You don't have to guess or you don't have to work hard, what I call working hard. So sometimes people literally don't say things because they want to be asked or they don't say things. Well, there's many reasons why someone wouldn't share or say something. I am saying to have a close, connected relationship, truth and transparency is vital. And friends of mine who are actually engaging in this process and being more truthful and transparent with each other, I know from myself and my own experiences, their comments are that they feel closer and more connected. Even sometimes if the emotions or what's being expressed isn't very nice even towards them, it's this relief feeling because now you don't have to work hard to work it out. It's so easy to know, oh no, they're really upset at me. There it is, you know, it's not all this underhanded, projected feelings that then you're left wondering what's going on. When someone's truthful and transparent, one, it's good for the person being truthful and transparent because it can help to bring up and expose emotion in them that they need to feel. Two, it's wonderful for anybody on the receiving end, whether that's friends, partners, children, because the child and the parents and your partner and anyone else knows where they stand. So you don't have to guess. You're not um, like working around all the time. There's uh, fear goes down because you're not having to guess. Also, resentment actually goes down because you've just been up front, everyone's up front, you know where you stand, you can talk about all of these things. And all of these things are very important to do so. Being truthful and transparent builds and helps to create a love-based relationship. Children are very truthful and transparent if left to their own devices and not influenced too much by their environment. Their children will often tell you all kinds of wonderful things. And I love conversations with children. They, they, don't, they just sort of say what they've heard or they share what they think. Uh, they have quite black and white thinking, but I love the way that they're so honest. 
I love the way um, in a playground sometimes I talk to children and they're like, well, I just don't like so-and-so. They did this and they shouldn't do it, you know, or they come out with some just wonderful things, like very often very accurate and on-point comments as well about what's happening in families if you're open enough to listen to children and what they are saying. In our family, the children have been encouraged to be open and transparent with their feelings and, and how they feel and what they observe and to speak up and things. So sometimes now it's quite adorable. They'll, I'll be doing something and, and they're like, Mum, you're just addictively engaging with, with me right now and this is not a good thing. Or it's not usually with them because they want the addiction. Most often it's like, uh, so like Izzy has often said to me, Mum, you're now meeting the demands of the boys and this is not loving and you are reinforcing that they can treat you in a bad way. You shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> and, and it's lovely because it, I go, oh, yeah, no, you're right. This is a problem. <laughs> um, and it's, they are now aware of it. And even when they were very, very little, sometimes they would say, Mum, you shouldn't meet my demands. Their feeling is, Mum, you should definitely meet my demands. So it's, Mum, you should definitely not meet my demands, but you should do it, kind of thing. But they could, they could use the language and actually tell me sometimes when I was out of harmony with love. And this is a lovely quality to develop. It takes some humility because often the parent-child dynamic is that the parent is power and authority and the child doesn't know anything. Now, I don't see it that way. I feel like a child is reflecting all the time to us all kinds of wonderful things that we can come to know and understand and learn about ourselves and about them and about love. To have children who are open and transparent and continue to be so, I feel is something to honour in a family and in that child. And as they head out into the world, I know that uh, two of our children particularly don't have so much of a filter and are a more honest and more tra tra transparent and truthful. They're not necessarily like loving in, in many things that they say or share, but they are more truthful and transparent and open about, about themselves. And I observe now sometimes them coming back and they're feeling quite upset because it takes some courage to be this way in the world because often the world is saying things like they're through their peers or other um, parents. They get comments about, about it and uh, I think I know one of our children had this interaction with a friend who was like, well, even if you think that, you shouldn't say it. Whereas at home, I'm like, no, say it. Like, why wouldn't you? And I value honesty and truth and transparency. I really value it. I, I love it. I love when people are like that. And so our home is quite a different environment to many other people's homes uh, where they're trying to be less truthful, less transparent. They're trying to have a facade about things, or even if they think things, they're not saying them. In my experience, just being open and transparent and saying what you think, gosh, it's wonderful. Like it clears, you know, it makes things simple. You find out how people feel very quickly. If people are upset and angry, it's highlighted very rapidly. You can find it, and they always would have been. I remember when we first started listening to Divine Truth, and uh, we were having a conversation with uh, Jesus and Mary and they were talking to us about, well, isn't it better to just be truthful, transparent, let the chips fall where they may, and then you very rapidly come to see what a person's character is and where they're emotionally at. And we found that by having a conflict, uh, the conflict early, and when I say that, I didn't look, go out seeking for conflict. I just was more truthful, open, transparent, said exactly what I thought. And the response of people would come up very rapidly when I did that. And at first that was um, a new way of living and it definitely brought up some emotions for me to feel through and to experience. But it also meant that it wasn't, say, six months or a year or two years down the road when you may have, you know, if they're an employee or if they were a friend or just anybody, that you'd invest a lot of time and energy in creating a false relationship, you know, and then maybe one time you say something and that person is like, oh, I don't like that, you know, and then they fly into a rage. If you just are honest and transparent and frank and to the point, uh, you know, at the beginning, everything's like comes up at the beginning. And then it shows our character of are we going to actually work through that and, you know, choose to love and choose to actually work things out in a relationship or are you going to cut and run, uh, meaning is a person not going to want to deal with the issue or you don't want to deal with the issue so there's no relationship. Now, to me... I think it's better to find that out early on because then you don't waste a whole lot of time. 
It doesn't mean in the future that person or you yourself might not work through issues and then come to have a relationship with that person again. That may well happen. By being truthful and frank and allowing things to be real at the beginning, I feel has a positive on-flow effect in every part of your relationship, whether that's business or family or partner or child. You know, any, any, any relationship is going to benefit from truth and transparency. Truth and transparency brings up a lot of emotion. By you being truthful and transparent, saying exactly what you think, without censoring it, even emotionally saying it. So if you're very upset, being upset. As again, with the proviso of not taking it all out on somebody else, but sometimes in a partner discussion, you know, you'll be talking and your emotions are coming up. And I don't see anything wrong with having a discussion and then you might be like feeling quite angry about something. And you, then you can just own that and be like, I'm actually feeling really angry right now. And then you can just take yourself off, go feel your anger and then come back. And once you've felt through that and felt through what's really driving the anger, what's underneath it, and that, you know, that's an emotional process, then come back and re-engage the conversation. And you might need to go away and come back and go away and come back until you've worked through enough emotion that you can have the conversation. But it's a wonderful way of communicating with others. And I know my everyday interactions, I'm pretty much like that every time. I don't dump my anger on other people. But if I feel angry about something, I'm like, no, I'm really angry about that. Or if I feel worried about something, I'm really worried about that. And being open about those things, it gives others permission also to be open about them. It also, well, that's what I find. And it, it means that things are a lot simpler and relationships are simpler. You're not second guessing every time. There's not all of that thing of, like, oh, do they really like me or do they have a problem or have I done something wrong? You may not have those feelings. They're feelings that I've had a lot of being very concerned and uh, trying to feel out what's really happening with people in the past to adjust myself so that I'd be acceptable to them or create a facade so that I perceived in myself that I was being what they wanted to be, that was for my to avoid emotions in myself. Now I, I, I find in those situations, I'm like, well, look, what's going on? You know, like, I, I feel this, what's actually you feeling? And it's an opportunity then for the other party to have a frank, open conversation if they choose to. Now, you don't have to, but by not doing so, you, there is an on-flow effect of unloving repercussions that happen by not being open and truthful and transparent. There's an on-flow effect of repercussions or results of not letting, like not working through your emotions and not feeling how you feel, not being transparent about how you feel. There is an on-flow of repercussions and there's, if you are just in a partner relationship at the moment and you don't have children, those will affect the relationship so much. And a lot of pain comes from not feeling your emotion. A lot of misunderstanding comes from not feeling your emotion. Blame comes from not feeling your emotion. Uh, a lot of joy and happiness and connection and close, closeness, both sexually and as an intimate relationship and as a friendship and as just getting to know another person, all comes from being truthful and transparent and feeling your emotion. Now, truthful and transparent is naturally coming into this conversation because being open emotionally and allowing yourself to feel how you feel, expressing your desires, expressing your feelings, even if they're unloving, expressing them. Again, all of the unlovingness. Allow yourself to admit to yourself where your sin is, like where you're not in harmony with principles of God's truth or, and of God's love, like where you're missing the mark of love, where you're out of harmony with God's love, where you're out of harmony with God's truth. We're out of harmony with principles and God's laws. Like that's sin. That's missing the mark of love. Let yourself be open about that. Discuss that with your partner. For an example, sometimes in, in partnerships, there's a whole like gaps in them. So you may be uh, emotionally close, but you're not sexually close. Or you might be having a lot of sex, but not actually be emotionally close. I, you can't really be sexually close if you're not emotionally close, but. But people try and we compartmentalise ourselves. But over time, there's a lot of dissatisfaction then with the relationship. And then often people explore and try and fill in and substitute either with their children or with other people or they end up having an affairs, whether they be emotional or sexual or both. And our relationships disintegrate. 
in my experience and from my observations, I feel it's because people are shutting down their emotion. They're not sweating the small stuff or when something comes up in the relationship, they're not communicating about it. They're not feeling about how they feel about it. There's a whole lot of projections from both parties sometimes about different things. I'm thinking, for example, when someone starts cheating on another person. There's a lot of feelings in that. And um, some people try to be okay with that. Or other people are so resentful and so angry and they never forgive the fact that it happened. Sometimes the person's not even sorry that they did it, but they're just paying lip service to it. There's so many emotions, say, in that. Now, that might seem like a big thing. And something like, oh, we're not doing that, or that doesn't apply to us. Well, what about just communicating? When you first met somebody, you're probably more interested in them. You, you felt quite special. You felt all like you really liked them. You were interested in them. You wanted to get to know them. Uh, you, or maybe you just wanted them to get to know you, and you loved the attention they lavished on you, and all of these things. That is not the basis of a strong relationship. But be honest about those things. And if you know your closeness is you're getting further apart, discuss that with each other and feel how you really feel about it. Feel your sadness about it. And if you're angry about it or your fear that you're no longer loved, that was in you before you met. But if you allow yourself to feel it, like whatever comes up in the relationship with your partner, is a wonderful opportunity to feel about all of this past beliefs and corrupt faiths you have about love and about love itself and what you believe love is and what you don't believe it is and what you think you should be getting from a relationship, what you think your partner should be giving you, all of those things. If you emotionally work through those, you'll clear them and you can come to a point where if you so desire, you can desire to give the gift of love and you can receive the gift of love. And if you base your relationship on giving the gift of love to your partner, or your children, you know, but in the which I was talking about partners, if you give the gift of love to your partner and that's your desire to love them because you think they're just absolutely lovely <laughs> and you want to know them and you really have this heartfelt, passionate desire to be with this person, to know them and understand them and uh, connect with them, and they have that same feeling towards you, wow, what wonderful things could happen. It's not going to be all peachy or rosy or like those romantic movies on the, on the TV that, that are misrepresentative of how, how relationships actually work. There might be times where you feel really far apart from each other. But if you work through emotionally the reasons why, you will come to a point where you will know whether that person is your soulmate or not. And if they're your soulmate, then over time you can develop a desire to really love them. You may also find that you come to find that you, you just got together for reasons that were completely out of harmony with love. You know, for addiction reasons, um, and quite a lot of women get, want men to give them safety and security. And men want to be a woman, a woman to sexually satisfy them. Um, this is just one example of many. But then they get together and they think that things are great until, you know, say the woman then goes, well, I, I'm kind of sick of just giving sex all the time. And the man goes, gosh, she doesn't even love me. She All she wants is you know, my money or my safety or my security or the illusion of it. And so he feels dissatisfied, she feels dissatisfied. Now there's a whole lot of pain in the relationship because the foundation was not built on love. It wasn't built on truth. I mean, if you go into a relationship and you know, you say, look, I just want you for safety and security, and they go, well, I just want you for your body, and so you have sex all the time. Well, now you're both really honest and you can go, oh, well, yeah, that's a bit unethical. Well, that's unethical in our relationship because actually I don't really want to give you sex. I just want safety and security. And then, the, you know, the guy can go, well, actually, you, you, you need to work through the emotions that you've got and cause you to feel unsafe and insecure so that you don't have that demand upon me. And then, you know, the guy can go, yeah, no, I need to work through the fact that I feel like I should be able to demand sex from you and you should give it to me. And he will need to work through why he feels that and she needs to work through why she wants to use him for that, for safety and security. So... You can learn a lot about relationships and imagine if we were that honest when we hooked up with a partner and we were really that self-reflective that we knew like, oh, I just want this guy because I think he's hot, you know, or I just want this woman because, you know, um, I want her to do all my cleaning, washing and all the jobs that I don't like doing in my house. Imagine if we really, we really set it up and we, we entered a relationship on those terms. 
probably you wouldn't get into a relationship with a lot of people, would you? But you'd also need to look at yourself and your own demands and expectations and your own feelings that you have coming out of you that are causing a problem in your relationship. Most of the time, you don't, you're not, we're not this honest, we're not this transparent, we don't know ourselves this well. And so you go in thinking that it's based on a whole lot of other things. And usually there's a whole lot of different attractions. So it's not just one thing. There's, there's various things that, that create the attraction in a relationship. Unfortunately, a lot of those, when we're in our unhealed, you know, injured emotional state, when we haven't worked through things emotionally, our attractions come out of a place that's not love. And it's not about being truthful and open and transparent and desiring to work through our emotional baggage and the things that, you know, our pains of our past and things like that. And so we take all of that into the relationship and then we think it's the other person's problem when things go wrong. That's not my experience. My experience is that if you're humble and you work through your own issues, that you actually come to love the other party more, you appreciate the other party more and you see them for who they are. You don't take all of that personally anymore. You just say, no, they've got some issues and they can work through those. And that goes for both parties. Both parties are capable of change and, and changing in, in a loving direction. It's just whether or not you want to. It does take two parties to change. So you may listen to these recordings, you may investigate the teachings of divine truth, you may make love-based change in your life and your partner doesn't want to. You can't force them to. You can't make them do that. You can't impose that upon them. You can try. It's not going to go well and you are being unloving by doing so. For the relationship to build and actually be a close, connected relationship, it takes two parties. And if one doesn't want to, again, there's going to be feelings to feel about that. So if both parties are working towards this common goal of love, and I've talked in previous videos of aiming for God's truth, and both parties aiming and seeking out God's truth, or the absolute truth of a situation, that automatically, if your heart is set on that desire, you're going to deal with anything in you that's out of harmony with love, and they're going to deal with anything in them that's out of harmony with love, because your common goal is to find what God's truth is. And that means being open to the possibility that you're wrong, you don't know, and you've got no idea. <laughs> and that you're not always right. And that something in you could be out of harmony with love. What you'll find is if both parties are doing that, you will, and you're seeking God's truth, and you're open to receiving God's truth from God directly or via the process of working through emotion, you will come to the same truths because truth is not subjective. Truth is absolute. There's God's truth is constant, it's firm, it's true, it's always the same. You may go through different emotions and then you'll come to understand the same truths. And that's a lovely thing, I think, about God's truth is that I think that's probably why it brings us all together and can connect us in relationships. Because when you have a feeling of, of a truth, that's true from God's perspective and someone else does too, well, you both understand that truth, you know it to be true. I've been talking about partners as a couple in your family or in, in, yeah, in your family and in your life, if you can work that relationship out, it has a very a positive on-flow effect to children in your care. A lot of this resource is going to focus on you and your partner. If you sort out the dynamics between you and your partner and in your, within yourself and your partner sorted out the issues within themselves, your children had far less issues and there'd be far less problems in your family. And when I say problems, it's just because we see them as problems because they either, you know, rile us up the wrong way or they make us feel uncomfortable or they're behavioural issues that affect others and we have feelings about that. So can you see how important emotion is? If we're not connecting to our emotion, if we're not releasing our emotion, if we're not self-reflective, if we're not seeing that our emotion is creating the reality we have right now, our emotion is affecting the relationships we have right now. When I say that, our unhealed emotional injuries, our false beliefs, our corrupt faiths about emotion itself and about a whole lot of things in the world that are out of harmony with God's love and God's truth, that's what causes the pain in our life. It's the sin that we are acting on. It's our responsibility to deal with that and to work through that. And us choosing not to feel our emotion 
us choosing to blame others, that causes pain in a relationship, that parts us. And that goes, everything I've said about partners, except for the uh, intimate um, sexual things, they are only to do with a partner. But as far as the way to interact of being truthful and transparent, of being open, of feeling your emotion in a self-responsible manner, not taking it out on others, of not blaming others, all of that applies to children. So don't blame children for what's happening. See them as reflectors. What in you is now being exposed? What emotion in you is being exposed for you to feel and learn more about love and truth? Another point about emotion is that emotion itself is just emotion. Like if it's just felt and released, it's gone. How we feel about emotion is another, is another thing. You know, we often feel that it's bad. We have these feelings that it, it's a terrible thing, that it's, it makes us powerless if we feel emotion. We're weak if we feel emotion. We may also have feelings that, oh, well, if I'm emotional, I get what I want. That's not really being emotional. That's using certain emotions to manipulate another person via their fear of emotions in order to get what you want. But emotion drives everything we do. So every decision you make is out of emotion. The things you choose not to do come out of an emotion. The things you choose to do come out of emotion. At some point, if you really work through all of your emotions and you have a desire to learn about love and you have a relationship with God and you receive God's love, you can become at one with God, meaning that you are in harmony with the way God feels about love and you understand what love is from God's perspective on all subjects and that you will live in harmony with that means you're at one with God's love, I suppose you could say. You can get to that point. But the journey to get there is a learning one. And being open to the possibility that you may be wrong on many or all subjects in your life is something to come to terms with. And one of those is that maybe you're wrong about emotion and your feelings and beliefs about emotion might not be correct. They may be quite distorted. In my experience, motion is a very healing experience and something to go through. It also uh, makes life simpler and internally feel calmer, more connected, more relaxed. It doesn't mean I'm relaxed and calm all the time, There's, you know, because emotions like that, it's sort of like you have emotion and when you're in emotion, it sometimes feels really hard or like it's never going to end. Like when you're feeling fear, you feel afraid. That's a terror, it can be, depending on what you're feeling about, a terrifying experience, but it passes. It's not like that all the time. Now, if you're living in terror 24-7, there's something definitely going on and you're not feeling it properly in order to release it. If you're angry like the majority of the time, you're not actually feeling and processing through the anger. You're living in your anger. You're remaining and acting and staying in your anger. Now, you're going to get ang like there is anger in us about all kinds of different things. A lot of it, some of it might be about angry about feeling your emotion. Now that's having a tantrum. You're just angry about it. You just need to have your tantrum and move on. You can also be angry though about what has been done to you. So sometimes children are angry at the injustice of what has happened. Now that anger can really help you to get to your grief. If you express that fully about the injustice has done to you and be very specific about what the injustice was, all this generalized stuff, that's not going to get you to the cause. It's not going to get you to the point. It's going to just keep you sort of in a cycle of not really feeling what is driving your actions and, and your experiences and what's happening in your life. So emotion is a very important, powerful expression of your soul and of yourself. And changing your, emo uh, your relationship with emotion so that you love your emotions, you enjoy feeling your emotions, you become emotionally expressive. This is part of your soul development and it's part of the natural course of where you need to go in order to be the full expression of your soul. And that's something that God's made you to be. So the more you resist it, the more you say, no, I don't want that. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I want to be someone else. I want to be this person that I'm creating. I want this facade. I want you to believe this facade. All of that is lies, lying to yourself, lying to others, not being truthful and transparent, and you're not going to connect your emotions that way. If you're worried about who you are, feel about that. Like, why don't you like yourself? Why do you feel like being a different part of yourself is better than being what you are right now? Um, do you have shame? Do you have uh, fears about if you're going to be accepted or not? Do you have worries about 
what people are going to, how people are going to perceive you. If you do, why? How do you feel about those? Emotion is happening all the time, whether or not we, ha we are expressing it. This is where children are reflecting, when I've talked about reflecting your unhealed emotions, and you may look and go, well, there's nothing to do with me, and I don't have any feelings about that. I feel if you have that reaction, you're probably very desensitized to your emotion or in denial or you just want to, you know, you don't even want to look at it and feel about that. <laughs> why? Why do, you, why do you have these beliefs about how it should be or what's happening? And if you're always trying to shut your kids down from fighting or expressing themselves or being themselves or if you have those like little feelings that might come up of judging your kids or being critical of them or making comments to them like you might there's all different methods we use to shut people down emotionally you may just look at them you may make jokes you may make fun of people and think that there's nothing wrong with that in my experience and my observation it's very damaging to children all those methods and techniques that someone uses if you don't like what's happening in your family go and feel about it be real about it you can say i don't like what's happening in my family you know you might not. You're allowed to feel that way. Again, though, it's about feeling the emotion in a self-responsible manner. You know, take yourself to your car, take yourself to your bedroom. Don't take it out on your children. I grew up in an environment with a dad who was exceptionally volatile and he would just fly into a rage and be like, well, I'm expressing myself and I'm like, great that he's expressing himself, but... The way that he expressed himself was all about taking it out on others. It wasn't just an off in a privacy of his own room or in the car. It was about, you know, and so as children, I felt, I don't know how my siblings felt, but I felt pretty terrified a lot of the time and I felt that I'd done things wrong. And even though as an adult he said, well, you didn't do things wrong or I wasn't angry because of that, that's not how it felt because he'd just fly into a rage, you know, when you sort of might have said something and there was no ownership about it. There was a projection that it was your problem. <laughs> or we had to share it or put up with it. Now, I'm totally for people being open emotionally and transparent, but we need to look at our motivations and intentions. And are we trying to take our emotion out on someone or trying to share our emotion with someone? Do we want people there so we can feel some power when they're a bit afraid and a bit scared and things like that, if we're really angry in this case? Do we want people to pander to our fear do we want people to meet our addictions, you know, fears, for instance? Do we want people to say, oh, they're there, make it okay? Some people, I've done this, and a lot of women do this, actually. They say they're afraid when they're really angry. Briefly mentioned before, beliefs about, about anger, and there's a lot of projection on women. If you're an angry woman, then you're dismissible, or you're just angry, you're not very nice, and all this. Now, anger is just one emotion that, that a woman might have, or a man might have seems to me to be more socially acceptable for men to be angry and vent their rage than it is for a woman. Now, as far as fear goes, men aren't supposed to be afraid. Women are allowed to be more afraid. And it's kind of an, a yucky exchange, actually, because uh, women kind of don't want to feel their fear and they want someone to take that away from them. So they have a demand to do that and they often get angry to avoid their fears. Men aren't really allowed to be afraid. That's not really a, an acceptable uh, emotion in men. So they're doing all these things to sort of overcome or prove that they are not afraid. Neither party's actually feeling them. Neither them's really dealing with the emotions. It's like they're just acting out in different ways to avoid emotion or they're trying to get other people to come in and help them to avoid their emotions. That's not feeling emotion. That's not expressing emotion. That's not actually a healthy way to deal with your emotion. Emotion needs to flow. It needs to come in and go through you. That's how it works. Emotion doesn't last forever. It, it's a finite experience. It happens, it goes through you, and it's done. You have to go do it to, to, to have the experience for yourself and have the faith that oh, I can do this. And you'll come to enjoy your emotion because afterwards when you've felt through and you feel how you feel and you express how you feel, you feel more connected to yourself, you feel more connected with others, you feel closer to others, you feel closer to yourself. There's more understanding and knowledge that comes. You know that it's going to have a benefit on your life. That faith comes from actually experiencing your emotion and going through your emotion. Emotion itself, there's nothing wrong with it. So fear, anger, rage, fury, terror, 
um, you know, happiness, joy, all of these things. Or, or the, we will talk more about, say, the, the, the more uncomfortable emotions that most people feel, so like fear, terror, or anger, or the darker emotions, if you like, that people often act on in order to avoid feeling what they really feel. So, you know, when they want power or control, often they're avoiding grief or feeling other feelings that are in them, like feeling, in, feeling about why they feel entitled to, to take power or control over others or how they feel powerless, or they might feel entitled to, to certain things, you know, and these are, there's emotions to feel in all of those things. The emotion themselves is not a problem. It's just an expression that comes through you and can be felt and released. Uh, the problem comes when we hold on to those emotions, when we store those emotions, when we don't feel those emotions, and then we act out upon them. In a previous um, talk, I just mentioned about how fear Basically, fear is responsible for most of the unloving actions that are taken in the world. I want to correct that. It's not fear itself. It's people not feeling and releasing their fear and terror um, that is the problem. It's them not actually actively working through the issues that they are afraid of. And because they don't work through them, they then act on them and take unloving actions. And that's how war is created. So by not feeling our fear or Superiority, superiority issues, you know, um, emotions to do with inferiority and, and superiority, emotions to do with terror, emotions to do with that we feel entitled to take things, whatever the, you know, there's different reasons why war starts, family feuds, not dealing with the rage we have, that how we've been treated, blaming others for what we have, wanting an eye for an eye kind of feeling of wanting revenge on someone because we want to avenge what's happened to our family. These are the things not feeling those, not emotionally experiencing those, not working through those in a loving, truthful manner, not being transparent about them, and really not feeling our grief about those things in the end, and having a fear of feeling our grief. All of the not feeling, the suppression, the denial, that of our emotional experience you know, so the denial of our fear, the suppression of our fear, not actually working through our fears, that is what creates the unloving things in the, in the world. That is what creates our unloving actions. That is what causes us to take our unloving actions. We could do it differently. We could actually feel the fear and terror and not act on it. We could feel our rage and our anger and get to our grief and feel the grief we have about what has happened to us or what's happened to families in the past or about how we feel, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, inferior to others, or how we feel powerless, or how we feel we have to do what the aggressor wants to do. We could feel that in the privacy of our own homes, or in the privacy of, you know, nature. There's a whole beautiful world out there where you can have some space and be alone. If we felt through that and we didn't act upon it, a lot of unloving things wouldn't happen. For instance, you might not go to war. And the people who wanted to go to war, if we all loved, maybe we could just leave them to have their fight it out and take everyone else and remove them from the situation. Then they'd be left sort of all these superior people fighting against each other and you wouldn't have everyone on the receiving end. Now, if those people were humble, they'd also feel about their superiority issues, why they feel that they're better than other people, why they want to have power and control over others, why they even feel like that's something that's acceptable in the world. Lots of reasons of why. And for each, you know, for different people, it's going to be different. That's a whole separate conversation to have. The main point is that not feeling your feelings, your emotions, not expressing them, storing them, holding them, and not releasing them, and then acting out of our unhealed emotional injuries is what causes the pain and suffering in our families, in our relationships with our partners, in our relationships with friends and family, us not feeling through those issues causes the pain and suffering. And it takes all parties to feel through their issues, not just one. And often in relationships, I notice that a, one party will feel like, well, if they dealt with all their stuff, our relationship would be great. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you must feel yours and they must feel theirs. And then the relationship has the potential to be great if you both choose, you know, God's way or desire basically a desire to love a desire for truth a desire to actually work through your unhealed emotional injuries and not blame the other person relationships are a wonderful way to be triggered if you, you can say triggered i don't really like that word 
relationships expose everything about ourselves. And that's why I love them, because every relationship you have, whether it's with a child, you, you know, as a parent of the child, as a, as a child and, you know, as a friend, or as friendships and partnerships, you know, even work-based relationships, acquaintances, even literally meeting strangers on the street or on the train or on public transport or at the airport, or whatever. All of these have these opportunities for us to learn more about love and truth. And so relationships are a one, and they can bring a lot of joy and happiness and connecting with another person, finding out about another person. I love those things. But it does take two parties for a relationship. If you're listening to this resource, you may feel like, I really want to engage this process. I want to do some experiments. I want to be more truthful and transparent. And if you're in an intimate relationship or with a partner, you may be like, they might be like, well, I don't want anything to do with that. You can still do it on your own and it will have positive uh, effects even if the other party doesn't want to because you'll feel better about yourself and the other party also uh, may be surprised at at what happens in the family in a good way. Also, they may really not like a lot of things that happen and they might not like the changes that occur within you. They have choices and they can choose not to be in the relationship or you may, may end the relationship not because you're doing the more loving thing, but because they don't want to do the loving thing yet. And it won't be because of any truthful, any loving action that you take benefits everyone, you and everyone around you. It does, and that's a fact. In a relationship, the other party might not feel that because they haven't worked through their false beliefs or their errors about love and their feelings and emotions. And if they don't want to work through it, then you've kind of had this thing happening where Say, for instance, you sincerely engage uh, this resource and the, you know, and God's way or, or divine truth, and you start growing in love, and you start becoming more aware and open and transparent, and not meeting people's addictions because you realise that's not loving. So no longer do you want to meet the addiction in your partner or your children. So and then they go, well, hold on, this is not what I signed up for. I signed up for you to meet my addictions and to do this and to have dinner on the table at five p.m. and you know, to make sure our house is really nice and to look after the kids. and Or the other party might be, well, I signed up for you to, to make sure that you were making the money and that you weren't emotional and that you were giving me safety and security. Whatever it is, there's many, many different things in different relationships. Those are just some examples. And if one party, it's a bit like if you've been in a relationship, especially for a while, and one party is like, well, no, our contract was based on these things, our unwritten contract. You don't necessarily write down, oh, I want you for safety and security and I want you for basically be my house slave, for an example. Or, you know, I want you to make me feel good and I want you to, you know, give me money or whatever it is. Or I want you so I can have kids and really once I've had kids, I don't really want much more to do with you. Or I want you because you make me look good or... I want you, what, what, whatever your wants or your desires were. If one party's still wanting the unwritten contract of what you first got into the relationship for, what you first attracted by in that relationship, or, or maybe it's that, ah, oh, in this relationship I don't have to feel, and you might have a list of things that you don't need to feel about. And if one party says, well, no, I want to remain the same, and the other party says, well, I want to grow and change. I don't want to do the codependence anymore. I don't want the addictions anymore. I want to know who you are that can unsettle the relationship. And it's a great thing that it's being unsettled. But if both parties don't want to go through the process of growing and developing and changing that relationship and building it on foundations of love and truth and connection and closeness and uh, being humble and having faith in, in a loving process and feeling their emotions, the relationships can only go so far and then decisions will need to be made of whether you stay in that relationship or you don't. Now, that doesn't mean that at some point in the future the other party won't work through their emotions and come to have a desire that they would also like to have that kind of relationship. But it's a choice of two parties, and I feel that's an important point to remember when you're going through it, because often in a partner relationship, when you start making changes, you want your partner to change too, and that's imposing upon their free will. They don't have to, but you can, and you have... You have the absolute opportunity to do so. So it's an individual choice, but it will affect your relationship if both parties don't choose to. And 
maybe very positively, which will inspire the other party to move forward with you and have a, a relationship based more on a love-based relationship and build a foundation on love. Or they may choose not to change at all and they want to stay the same and they want you to remain the same for what they signed up in the relationship for. And if that happens, you may get to a point where you say, I don't want to stay in this relationship anymore because what we want is really different. And you can part ways amicably or you may part ways messily and that would just be an attraction. And if you're humble to your emotions, you'll feel through that and you'll work through the reasons of what in you causes you to have those feelings. Emotion is one of the key things in this resource and it's, there's principles of emotion as well. There's overarching principles and then there's smaller sort of detailed principles. That's kind of how I look at them. But one of the principles of emotion is feel your emotion and you can gain more truth. I want to clarify that point. If you feel your own emotion, you sincerely feel it and you're feeling the actual emotion that you have. It's not sort of a fake emotion or a deception emotion or a fabricated emotion, but it's a real emotion that you have. You'll find more truth about yourself and the events that happened that caused that emotion you know, in you and, this, and why you've stored it. And when you release it, you'll understand the full picture about the events, about why you feel that way and what created those feelings in you and all of these things. Now, if you have a desire for the truth, God's truth on the situation, about what is loving and truthful from God's perspective, but you must have a desire in order to know that. And that would be emotional process as well, and you'd come to know more truth about whatever you, subject you'd like to. So feeling your emotion about your personal experience is going to give you more truth about what happened in, in, for you in that situation and you'll come to understand your own feelings, experiences, what happened. Understanding God's truth, you can then understand the full picture of the facts of everything that happened and all the components and your part and why you did it and why others did it and all of these different things. But emotion opens up that opportunity for it to happen. Your desire is what creates whether or not you gain God's truth about the matter on it. So just to, to um, review a couple of the points that we've made so far. One is that emotion is made to flow through you. Emotion is a, an, can be an intense experience, but it does flow through you and it, it goes. It's a finite experience. It's not a forever thing. So you may be going through a like what you feel is a hard or... Sometimes people might call them dark emotions or, you know, you may feel really angry for a time, you may feel very afraid about something for a time. You, if you work through and you feel that to its end, that will be gone on that subject in that, that situation. It will if you sincerely feel it to the end. And there'll be other emotions that come up through that emotional process. And they will, they will be, they will just flow through. If you just let them flow through, your emotion just comes in and it goes. Emotion also can become an enjoyable experience, one that you look forward to and you embrace and you love and, and you want to do it. And that's a lovely place to be. We're made to be in that place. So we've got changing your relationship with emotion, so looking at your false belief and your corrupt faith about your beliefs about emotion itself and about you personally experiencing and expressing your emotion and also how you feel about others experiencing and expressing their emotion. All of those things are a great self-reflection exercise that you can do immediately. You could do it now. You could pause the video and do it now. Or you could do it after you've finished watching this video. Emotion is the way that we express ourselves. It's our, it's our soul expression. I spoke about emotion being the way that God communicates with us via feelings. And that's the way that if we're sensitive, then we can feel the gentle, it's like the gentle whisper of God's uh, feelings towards us. God's not loud and in our face. God's laws can sometimes get loud and in our face if we're in, in too much out of harmony with them. But God's communication is actually a very soft, gentle feeling that we must open emotionally to actually recognise and come to feel and to, to then to communicate with God. Emotion that is denied, unfelt, suppressed, causes illness, suffering, pain, uh, depression is like the suppression of all emotion. Uh, illnesses are caused by us suppressing emotion in ourselves and not feeling it, not wanting the truth about love on some subject that causes an illness in our body. Emotionally attempting to deny truth 
about love, whether it's love of ourselves, others, the environment, causes illness in our bodies and our bodies to reflect our lack of love and our lack of desire for truth about love on whatever subject it is and each part of the body represents a different emotion. Spoke about how emotion itself is no issue, emotions are, are not a problem. It's the denial of the emotion and then acting in emotions in order to avoid feeling them that is the problem. I've briefly covered in other presentations about addictions and emotional addictions or physical addictions are used to suppress emotion. And these are, and addictions are very damaging, they're not loving, and they're problematic for our health, our well-being, and our life. It is, ended up being the suppression of emotion that kills us in the end. Our bodies end up not being able to function anymore because we're not releasing emotion. So the more emotion that we can let flow through us, the less we will age and the less that we will have physical ailments in our body. So any physical issue links up with an emotional cause. And it's interesting to look and discover those things. And you can get information via the conscience, which is your direct truth channel with God, as I've talked about in other previous presentations. You can also get information via God's laws, which are trying to help you to see where you're out of harmony with love and truth and correct you in the gen most gentle possible manner they can. So that means if you've got a very, very serious disease, which would mean you've been suppressing a lot of emotion or, or truth about love for a long, long, long time. And that is a way, the gentlest possible way that can be demonstrated to you that you have an issue out of harmony with love in your soul and that you have an opportunity to heal it if you work through the emotions. You could heal very, very, very damaged uh, a physical body, but there may be a point where, where it can't be healed, but I'm, I'm not definite on that subject. As a parent, when we do not feel our emotions, it causes problems in the family. And I've spoken about in previous videos of children being reflectors of their parents' unhealed emotional injuries or you know, the feelings that parents have that they're in denial of and they're not expressing and not feeling. When as a parent, we allow the emotional experience and we allow emotions to flow, then the children don't need to reflect them back. Now, children aren't consciously thinking, I need to reflect this emotion back to mum and dad. They're just doing it. It's like a soul-based interaction. They're just responding. They're not intellectually aware. When they're very small, they've got, like, really when they're a baby, they've got zero intellectual awareness. And that's something that develops as they grow and get older. I noticed with our kids, it was really interesting as when they were really, really little, they didn't even think about things. They, didn't, they just didn't even think that. It's almost like they just acted or responded to everything that was happening in the environment. As they've got older, like now they're starting to articulate how they feel and their responses to things and what they're observing. And you can actually see the intellectual development and the self-awareness that they're gaining. Some subjects, they're completely still not self-aware at all, but some, they have this awareness of their own feelings and their contribution to what's happening in certain situations and they're observing, they're putting into words some of the feelings that they have now about interactions between other adults, interactions about us as their parents, interactions between themselves and their friends and other people that they meet. And it's quite a lovely, I feel it's quite a privilege to watch that development process, particularly when children are connected to how they feel. It's quite fascinating and very insightful often about what's really going on for them and how they feel and their experience that they're having. And I'm really enjoying getting to know uh, children via their experience, not about what their parents think or what their parents are imposing upon them. When we as parents are not feeling and we're suppressing, they are just reacting to all the things in our soul that we're not wanting to be aware of and they're reflecting those back to us. When we are living in our anger or our fear or denying certain emotions, then children don't feel loved anymore and they can then act that out as well. There's a withdrawal of love when we are not expressing our emotions. When I first began experimenting with expressing emotion, I had a fear and a false belief that by expressing my emotions, somehow I'd cause damage to others. And that was a belief that had been instilled in, in me as a child of that if my emotions were hurting other people. This is not true. It's absolutely not true. 
Your emotions only hurt people when they're suppressed and denied and when you act in the emotion. If you feel the emotion, you express the emotion and you let that emotion release from you, that is not hurting other people. In fact, that's creating the most freedom in your environment for everyone there because they're not putting up with a projection. Your emotion is now being owned and felt and released. So no one else, it's like, it's making it personal rather than someone else's problem. It's just you and you're feeling it and you're letting it out. It's just a process that happens organically and beautifully if you let it occur. It's one of these things that takes a lot of effort to suppress, which is why I think illnesses and, and other things occur in your body, because the suppression of emotion is like block, it kind of causes blockages and problems. Whereas when you let it all flow out of you, it just releases and it's gone. And ironically, if you've ever been in the situation where someone is just allowing themselves to feel their emotion, it, there's the least demand, expectation, uh, blame, or any feelings coming out towards you. It's actually really lovely. Like, I enjoy being around people who are emotionally open. I love it because you know, I'm never second guessing myself. I, there's not a lot of projection at me. You can feel yourself more because you don't need to worry about them and what's coming at you. <laughs> not that that's a loving thing in itself anyway. But for me, I've had an injured feeling of being very concerned about other people's feelings. And uh, now it's sort of more you can just feel how you feel in response to what's happening in your environment. And if you let yourself feel, then there's no judgment, there's no blame. It just happens and everyone you know, works through their issues. In a family, if parents are allowing their emotional experience, then the children don't uh, take any of that emotion on. You, it's just released and it's gone and the children don't have to reflect it. They don't absorb it. It's, it's actually the most loving place to be is to feel your emotion. When we don't feel our emotion, so every time that we are afraid and we don't allow the experience of the fear, then the children feel that as a withdrawal of love. And they feel very, then they often feel afraid or they start taking actions to try and get that love back. If you're really angry and you're just uh, um, attacking somebody or taking that out, as an example, a dad who is attacking their child and yelling at them and saying, I'm doing this because I love you, there's zero love in that, in that equation. A mum who's raging at their child and saying, I'm doing this because I love you and you did the wrong thing and you need to learn and this is going to help you. None of that is love, and a child will experience it as fear on being the receiving end of, of that. They will not feel loved, and they will not hear you, actually. So if you're really angry and upset and attacking and barraging someone with emotion, particularly like, say, fear, anger, or the you know, shame, or some of the, the emotions that are, we find more harder, some of the emotions that... Uh, make uh, like they don't feel feel very good to 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 experience or be on the receiving end of you're actually imposing all of this emotion onto the children and the children will feel the withdrawal of love from you they won't be able to hear you properly they won't absorb what you're saying they will absorb emotionally and they'll have an emotional response and that response will now be in them if they're allowed to feel that response so if you are attacking them heavily and they're allowed to feel their fear which is very hard if you're being attacked so you'd have to be an exceptionally developed uh, child, which uh, if you think about yourself in the same situation, if you're under you know, a barrage of attack, how do you respond? Often you either like, withdraw and you just sort of like, you plic uh, you know, try and avoid it, get away from it, try and placate and stop it, or get real angry back. None of those are loving responses. For example, if you just let yourself cry as, as someone was attacking you, then ironically, they'd probably stop attacking you. Well, they may not, depend on the person. Um, I've had the experience where someone was fully attacking me and I just started crying because that was my real response. And they just stopped in their tracks because they're like, whoa, whoa, what's happening? Like, <laughs> They saw the response, like my response to being attacked and it made them just, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, self-reflect. Whereas in the past, I'd tried to sort of fight anger with anger, which just becomes a power play and it never works out well. I tried to placate, which then reinforces the angry person. They can be more angry and they're going to get what they want. I have tried to, uh, you know, like just get away. 
uh, not leave though. So that was something that an experiment that I did. It's when someone was angry and they just wanted to barrage and I attempted a number of different methods to resolve the, the situation and, one, and it didn't resolve and they just wanted to keep um, attacking. So I just left. And that was huge for me. It was huge. But wow, it was powerful. One, um, as soon as I left, all my emotion came up. So I was able to really connect to just the sadness and how unfair it felt and a lot of different things, that the injustice of it and all kinds of different feelings came up for me and just the sadness of being attacked by someone rather than just being able to have a conversation about something. Uh, and for them, it was really powerful too because no one had ever left. <laughs> and so suddenly like, there was no one there to attack anymore and they weren't getting what they, they were using that you know, attacking barrage to get. And that was a lovely experience and caused me to see that by acting in what you really want to do, you know, often when we're in a situation we feel we have emotional reasons why we stay, but if we loved ourselves we'd probably leave. And this is sort of something to experiment with. You can experiment with all different things and see what happens, you know. My motivation was to bring up emotion and to feel what was going on and to understand those situations better and so that when they happen again that I could act in a more loving, truthful manner under the same um, situation. And so if your motivation is to feel emotion and to emotionally work through things in it so that you have make soul-based change, then it's very helpful to experiment and try different ways of doing things. And you'll find out and learn about love that way if you desire to. So when a parent is living in their emotion or they are um, living in their fear or they're angry, a child no longer feels loved. Fear and love cannot exist at the same time. Very important to remember. Emotion itself is loving, loving to express it. It's when we deny it or suppress it or do not feel our emotions that problems start occurring in families. And then if we take the family, that's like the micro climate. And then if in society, if, if a collective group of people and families don't deal with their emotions and work through various things and shut those down, then that becomes a societal issue and then it can become a national issue and then it can become an international issue and over generations we have a lot of problems because of unhealed emotional injuries. So as parents I feel like we have this lovely opportunity that in a number of, you know, just a few generations we could make a lot of positive changes because if the parents change then that's going to have an onflow effect in the family to the children and if the children, like if we just did like one or two things, if we chose to love which a loving act is feeling your emotion in the family and both par parties in a, in a partnership, or, you know, both parents or caregivers or all the adults in the ha home, however many there are of you living in one home, whether that's one, two or multiple. If every single adult owned their own emotions, felt and said, I'm going to now do this emotional ex investigation and I'm going to feel my emotions as they come and let them feel through and I'm going to work through all the reasons and beliefs I have about emotion itself and so that I have a heartfelt soul opening that emotion is a wonderful experience that is completely natural and normal and you work through all of that and then you had children and then the children came into an environment where being emotional was absolutely acceptable, being truthful, transparent, open, allowing the free expression of their emotion in a self-responsible, loving manner and that's how the parents modelled that and that's the feeling they had with a the child, then those children would be emotionally open and they'd express their emotions. You can see that over generations it would become normal to be 100% emotional beings. It would become the normal in, family, in that family to be emotionally expressive, to be truthful, to be transparent, to act on your desires and your passions. There'd be less than impediments, there'd probably be less illnesses, they'd probably look really young and youthful and um, happy and, and be much more connected and close and feel more about, they'd feel themselves better in the sense that they'd understand themselves and know who they were, their nature, personality, passions and desires, they might meet their soulmates really young. They would uh, then in the world, there'd be an influence on everyone else in the world as well. There might be some conflict as they hit up other people who were not in that situation. But if their family background had supported that from their birth or their conception, and they didn't have any false beliefs about it, you can see that over a number of generations the relationship to emotion would change and in that family it would be completely different. 
um, if, if each generation decided to act upon that and develop further, which each generation usually does. They usually develop further than the previous one. Now, if multiple families did that and a collective group of people did that and, and a whole number of families did that, you can see how it have an exponential effect. And in a number of generations, many changes um, that would be more loving and truthful and would be a much nicer society to live within. Now, you can take any, any issue. You could take environmental issues. You can take personal issues of love and truth. You know, if everyone decided they were going to tell the truth in a loving manner, Wow, wouldn't, now, wouldn't it uh, change? Is that movie, I think, about things called Liar Liar or something? I've never actually watched the whole thing, but I love the concept of it, where he cannot lie. I would love that. I would just love it. Imagine if everyone couldn't lie anymore. Like, it was absolutely impossible to tell lies. You had to actually do, to be truthful. Apparently that's what it's like in the spirit world. You get to there and there's no facades anymore and your facades sort of go, so you're acting exactly as you want to. Probably kind of scary place for a while in this world because people, I think, uh, the facade and certain laws and um, people's concern to a degree about, about how society perceives them causes them to not take as many um, actions. They still have the intentions and motivations of wanting to do a lot of unloving things. And so when you go to the spirit world, it becomes much more transparent and easy to see. In saying that, as, as you become more emotionally aware of yourself, you do begin to feel people more accurately and get a sense of, where, of what people's true motivations and, de and desires are. But while we have emotional blocks in certain areas, it's hard to see that. I know for myself, it's sort of like this clueless thing I sometimes talk about. When you're not emotionally connected and you're not dealing with, um, and you're not releasing your own emotional ends from the past and your injuries and unhealed feelings in yourself, of the experiences you've had in your past. It's hard to gauge when, uh, it's hard to gauge certain situations accurately. For myself personally, I'd put myself often in quite dangerous situations physically um, and emotionally because I hadn't felt through emotions and I gravitated to people who actually would treat me in the same way I'd been treated in my past. As I've been working through certain issues on certain subjects, I now have more awareness. That's what it feels like. It's sort of like this growing awareness and I get this feelings now. Sometimes I feel it's my spirit friends helping me to feel certain things and giving me just an, uh, like a, a nudge in the right direction of saying, oh, this isn't going to be very good for you. And sometimes I feel it's a feeling that I have that I'm feeling the other person of like, oh, wow, no, hold on. There's some things here that um, just to be aware of. And, you know, you can raise those or talk about them, but it's not like I'll throw myself into dangerous situations now without any awareness whatsoever. I'm not completely aware about everything. This isn't something that I'm just noticing in, in certain areas. And there's things now that I wouldn't, I just wouldn't do. Whereas in the past, I wouldn't have thought twice and I'd be in doing them. This is a positive result and a benefit of working through and feeling my emotions is that I'm now more aware of myself, I'm more aware of where I have, I refer to them I suppose as holes of, or openings to unloving attractions with other people and unloving interactions with people. And as I've become more aware of those things and that's been an emotional process, then now I have more of a sense of myself. And so then when I have certain responses and feelings, I take more notice of those. And then I can start to figure out, oh, what am I feeling from, these other, from someone else? And sometimes that's perception and it's not what I'm actually feeling. And sometimes they are real feelings. And that's another emotional thing to work through in order to understand and become clearer about that. I found that I began relying a lot on sort of people's behaviours or actions. And now I'm working more on motivations and intentions. As a side note, God looks at motivations and intentions we have as much as the actions we take. So even if we do not take an action, but we have the motivation or the intention that we'd like to, but we just don't act on it, that is also under God's laws measured and also corrected or, you know, when there's a, a, either a reward or consequence for that. Because you may have motivations and intentions in a loving direction that you may not act on for, like you, you would act on them, but something stops you externally. 
and those would be then rewarded with via God's laws because you had this beautiful intention to do something loving that would, you know, a truthful work that would actually um, help others or be a good thing in the world, um, in a, a loving thing in the sense of good. Or you may have intentions and desires and motivations that are very disharmonious with love and they are very negative and damaging to other people. And, you know, like I suppose you could say an example could be, you know, really you hate someone and you desire them for bad things to happen to them. Well, that's not a loving place to be. And if your intention is that, but you don't act on it because you want to seem like you're nice, that's, you're, you're actually, God's laws measure that. So with children, you can say things and not take certain actions. Like you may, you may want to be really violent towards a child. You may have this feeling of wanting to hurt them, you know, but you don't because you, you fear the perception of, of people. You fear maybe the perception of others. You still, that intention and that desire, if the perception of others wasn't there, you probably would act on it. And so that's something to really look at is your motivations and your intentions is to look at and feel about why you have those. So in that example of if you did feel quite violent towards children, but you, know, you may not take the action to hit them. Some people do take the action to hit them. And in a way, that's a bit more transparent. I don't condone that or think it's a very good idea because you're actually being violent to a child who's done nothing to you and never deserves violence ever at your hand. Um, the reason why you feel that you can be violent will come from some beliefs that you have and also feelings and uh, that you have not felt in yourself. It may give you feelings as well to, to be that way. So sometimes it can be things that have happened to you that you're trying to avoid, and sometimes it can be because you want to because it gives you certain feelings. So all of these are emotional, and all of them have emotional-based reasons. But if your intention is to harm a child and you don't act on it, God's law is still working on those things, and your child will feel that. A child, children are very sensitive, and though they might not be articulate, they're still very sensitive in absorbing everything that's happening in their environment and reflecting that. As an example, when our children were very small, they would sometimes be quite afraid of certain people. Now, sometimes that's because I was actually afraid and they were reflecting that back to them. Sometimes because those people actually had a propensity to rage, anger, and uh, fury to some, some extent, and also to physical or emotional violence. And it was noticeable that the children would Oh, I had different on different circumstances because there were some slightly different things. But it was noticeable that the children would actually not want to spend time with those people and they would avoid them. It can happen that sometimes you're more attracted to the more violent person uh, and depending on what your emotional injuries are. So you can sort of repel or be attracted. So if you look at um, as a, an example and a common example, sometimes you may have grown up in a violent home and then you get quite attracted to a man who either has a facade of not being violent but has a tendency to violence or uh, may you know, be quite violent under certain circumstances and we often think that we have this uh, weird perception that somehow we're safer with someone who's going to be more violent and volatile. Sadly that's not true. Uh, someone who has a tendency to violence is going to be violent under certain circumstances to you, to anyone, it doesn't matter who you are. Yet we have this weird self-perception that we're safe with them due to unhealed emotional distorted beliefs from our childhood. We're actually more sa we're going to be the safest with a person who honours love and truth and is truthful and transparent under all circumstances than we are with someone who you know, is physically violent or we perceive to be strong um, or emotionally violent because it, could, it's not, it can be either gender and it can come in all different forms. As I'm speaking, I'm just thinking about how distorted our understanding of love is and how distorted our beliefs are about what safety and security is and how we go about getting those things. Unless we release the emotions in us that cause us to feel unsafe and insecure. As example, if, if we don't feel safe and secure, then there's an emotions in us that are causing us not to feel that way. And if we release those emotions, we will come to understand that we actually are safe and secure and protected. 
and having a relationship with God can show us that and God's laws protect us. If we do not emotionally go through that experience and release the emotions that cause us to believe that we are not safe and secure, then we will never feel safe and secure. Another example is if you feel unloved, you're not going to ever feel loved regardless of how much somebody genuinely loves you until you release the feelings of not feeling loved. And that's another emotional experience and an emotional process that you must go through in order to get to that point. It's, not, it's unavoidable. So the faster that you can change your relationship with emotion, the more that you can come to love your emotion, the more that you can just be expressive of your emotion, one, it's going to help you personally to grow and develop. You'll see the world more clearly. You'll see the world quite differently, actually. Also, your children are not going to be on the receiving end of all of this unhealed emotion. Your children are not going to reflect back all of the unhealed emotions. Your children also, if you're being emotional, expressing your emotion, allowing of your emotion, then they will also feel loved, or if you desire to love them, and they'll be able to, but they will clearly be able to feel when they're not loved and when they are. And that withdrawal of love won't happen because you're feeling your emotion rather than acting out of the emotion. One of the key points in this presentation was that to feel, emotionally, uh, to feel emotion responsibly, particularly emotions such as like shame, anger, rage, not act out of those emotions. Feel them, stick with them. It, it can feel challenging and hard and uncomfortable, but stick with them and really feel through them, not act out of them. Now, the key point about emotion is that when you have a feeling, that's about you. No one made you feel that or forced you to feel that. That was your emotional response. So when we've got little children, the way that parents act, as we, as a little child, we have a response to that. Often what happens is we may have been treated in a certain way as a child and we would have had a natural response. Our natural response often gets shut down and then we store that emotion and we weren't even allowed to express that, uh, to express a feeling. So let's take a, you ye you're yelled at as a child. And your emotion might just be to cry because you're so, you're scared and feel your fear and to be scared. Now, that would be your natural response. Often then parents try and shut the child down from crying, trying to shut their fear down. And then that fear and that sadness is stored in the child. And then they may get angry or anger might be allowed. So then they'll just get angry at the response that's happening and fights occur. If you're sensitive as a parent, you will see that by shutting down their emotional response, you've just done a very unloving thing to your child because now you've caused them to store that emotion until another event happens, probably outside your company, so when they're an adult, that they're going to need to work through. And a lot of things you can look at with children and feel about your own childhood and then look at how you're treating your children and you know the children in your care. And you can look and go, wow, yeah, that happened to me and it didn't have very good results. You know, like I was shut down, that felt really bad. If you're doing the same thing, it's going to feel real bad for your kid too. And it's worth examining and looking at those things and stopping doing the same thing that happened to you. There's a lot to unpack with your emotion and your beliefs about emotion and how you feel about emotion and then being emotional and expressing your emotion. It can happen very rapidly if you have a desire to do it. And you don't need to think about it too much. It's just about feeling. But at first, you may need to self-reflect about, well, I'm not feeling things, or I don't, um, I'm not connecting emotionally to things, or I judge this emotion, or I feel like if I express that, bad things are going to happen. I've talked to people who say, I, I will, I can't express my anger because I'm got, I'm scared. Well, some people actually have been very honest and have said, I can't express my anger because I'm very afraid of what I'll do. I see them as actually afraid of what they'd do if they acted in their anger, but they're quite afraid of just expressing the rage they have as well. Or sometimes it's quite interesting, uh, one person said that to me, I'm very afraid of my anger, and yet they're passive aggressive all the time, so they're not really afraid of anger, it's just the overt expression of anger that they have some beliefs, false beliefs about, and some corrupt faith about that they don't want to release that. For this person in particular, it's about their facade and they don't want to... Um, seem like an angry person because then that makes them seem like they're not a good person anymore. And that's something for them that they need to work through because they're not actually a good person yet anyway and in the sense of love and they're not being truthful and transparent and open. They're actually shutting down their anger and they need to feel it and they'd be much happier for doing so.
in that case, it's also covering a lot of grief and they don't want to feel that grief. So, and why I give you that example is to show you that a lot of the time we have these false beliefs about our own emotion and what we will do. But again, you get a choice. You can feel without acting or taking it out on another person. And when I feel, I mean really feel, like if, you know, I'm thinking like of anger a lot because there's a lot of anger in our world that we need to feel. And fear, fear and anger are two things that really need to be felt. And often anger comes up first. So, you know, if you had, I don't know, an old car or something, you could smash the car up. You really, that, you take a baseball to it, bat to it. You know, you really use it on that. It's an inanimate object that's not going to suffer. And you can really take a lot of stuff out on that if that's how angry you feel. There's a lot of other ways to express anger, though. You can punch a punching bag. You can, you know, rip stuff up or break stuff. Or, but again, don't break all your good stuff. Get some things, get yourself like a equipment in order that it's like not your best china or something or it's not your only plate or it's not your wife's stuff or your husband's gear you know don't don't take it out on them as we've been saying again though if it's I suppose objects or whatever it's better on that than it is on a person so but I, I feel set yourself up for success set yourself up for success so set yourself up a place where you can feel what you feel and make it a, a, a soul space I suppose you could say a soul, a soul development space where you can feel what you really feel. Now, fear is another one. A lot of most people try and avoid fear. That it's, they find it very challenging to feel. But fear comes out in all different ways. So crying is crying is a quite an expressive mode of feeling a lot of things. There can be angry cry. I found there can be angry crying. There can be furious crying. There can be sad crying. There can be like sobbing grief out. It can be fear based, like fear crying. All of these different things. I sometimes see babies and I am starting to sort of try and feel about what the baby feels and what's really going on and what they're responding to. And it's very interesting to listen to the different cries they have because they have different cries for different emotions. And often they're crying and that's the feelings are all sort of coming out in that way. They obviously, they giggle and all kinds of lovely other things as well. And they have those emotions as well. So when I talk about emotion, there's a whole spectrum Focusing mainly on, I suppose, the darker emotions or the emotions people perceive as darker or more negative, or, but they're really enlightening those emotions. And I'm focusing on those because those are ones that need clearing. Uh, in a sense, they need to be healed within you. They need to be felt and explored and released in order that they no longer affect your future. And so those are what I sort of focus on the most. But again, apply these beliefs if you've got false beliefs or feelings about like corrupt faith about you know expressing your joy emotions and your wonder and all these emotions work through those as well so that you can express both ends I find if you're unwilling to express your emotion in one area it shuts down most of your emotions in other areas so being open and about all emotion and willing to feel well coming to love feeling every emotion you have because all of those emotions are about you learning about yourself they're things that may have happened to you or it's your experience of what's happening to you and emotions are your way to express that so it's a wonderful thing to do in order to be yourself and to become emotionally expressive in summary I've spoken about changing your relationship with emotion becoming to be a hundred percent emotional being about how emotion itself is just something that flows through you and if you love and enjoy your emotion, you'll just express and experience it and it will be whatever it is. So when we deny and hold on to our emotion and suppress it, that depression happens, that we, you know, that's the suppression, full of suppression of emotion. It's also when things like suicide happen, it's when illness happens, all of that is suppression or resistance to emotional expression. It's a way of God's laws showing us that suppressing emotion is bad, literally bad for our health. And it's also going to eventuate in our physical body's death if we do not let emotion flow through us and release emotion. So emotion is a very important part of our soul expression. I spoke about how unhealed emotional injuries in the parents are then reflected by children and how when a parent is living in their emotion so they're, and they're acting out of those emotions rather than feeling and releasing them, that a child feels very unloved and the, the withdrawal of love. That's very distressing for a baby and a small child and for children in general 
and it's why we then feel so unloved often because our parents are living in, a, in their unhealed emotions like fear or anger or shame or grief or oh, not, not so much grief. Grief is a very healing emotion. Um, but by denying our emotions and not allowing the expression of them, then that causes the, everything in our environment to feel very unloved by us. I was talking about how anger and fear cannot exist at the same time as love. And so if you are not releasing your anger and you just have a projection of anger all the time, you're storing your anger, then there's not going to be much love coming out of you either. If you're storing your fear and you're not feeling and releasing the fear, then that also causes a lack of love in the environment. I spoke about how it's not emotion itself that causes all of these unloving things in the world. It's by not feeling and releasing emotion and then people taking actions in those emotions or to avoid those emotions that cause all the unloving uh, actions and various things that happen in the world. So war, and, for instance, is caused by people not dealing with emotions. Murder, caused by people not dealing with emotions. Rape, not dealing with emotion, people not dealing with their emotions. All have different emotional signatures, but they all are about not dealing with emotion. Revenge, not dealing with your emotions. Um, you know, not dealing with your grief, basically. There's a sort of a new, new point, I didn't say this in this, but grief is a, heal, a very healing emotion. People shut down their grief so much and it has many, many, many on-flow detrimental effects because grief is the way that we heal. Grief is the way we come to know things. Grief, by releasing our grief, it also then helps us to find like, the cause of why things have happened and also to come to a place of forgiveness. If we don't feel through all the other emotions, it's, you can't get to your grief. You can't skip emotions to get to it. So, for instance, there's sort of... Not always, but there's really like sort of a progression of emotions. Often we have anger first and then there's um, our, well, we often have denial and then anger, then addictions. And we want to barter about certain things and, and negotiate. Then we want to, uh, then there's fears, then there's grief. And once that's released, then we come to a place of understanding more truth and healing and, and forgiveness if you go through the entire process. Grief is a great healer. And if we suppress our grief, and then that means that we're not feeling it, we remain in either our addictions or anger or fears or all of those, and then we start acting out of those, and then all of these damaging things happen in the world. We treat others in an unloving manner. We take unloving actions. Because when we're living in emotion and we're not feeling through and, and releasing our grief about various things, and when we live in our anger or our fear, we believe that what we feel is real rather than just seeing it as an emotion. And this is something that we need to see. It's just another emotion. Fear is just another emotion to be felt. Anger, just another emotion to be felt. Shame, just another emotion to be felt. We need to feel it and release it. And that way we'll become the most loving person that, that we can be. And part of becoming a loving person is feeling emotion. This presentation has been recorded because emotion is so fundamental to you making soul-based change. You cannot make change without it being an emotional process. Emotion will be spoken a lot about in this resource and it is essential for close connected relationships between parents and children and also between partners and um, adult relationships. So if a parent is shut down to their emotion, they're also going to shut a child down to their emotion, expressing their emotion. And that's not something that you want to encourage. You want to encourage a child to be a 100% emotional being and to uh, like honour and help them to remain emotional. You know, babies are already emotional. They've got it down. They know what to do without even having to think about it. It's us who have come to a place of suppression and denial and, you know, toning ourselves down. So in a way, we need to become more like the children are with their expression of emotion and create a soul-based openness to others expressing their emotion, particularly allowing children to do so. So I wish you all the best in changing your relationship with how you view emotion and to feel rather than act out of your emotion as it is not feeling your emotion that actually causes the damage in relationships. I will talk about emotion more in future presentations. Uh, for now, 
if you choose to experiment with what has been presented in this presentation, um, all the best. If you have any questions, please send them through to aloisa.lh.com and I can make some further videos. There will be follow-up videos on emotion and other things as it comes up during the resource.